All right, so thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I'm Victor. I'll be talking a little bit about the GT34 deposit. So uh, here is a brief outline of how the talk will be structured. So first I'll talk a little bit about the geological context and give a brief introduction. Uh, then I'll show some evidence, basically petrography and chemistry, whole rock and mineral chemistry. Uh, I'll touch on the geochronology, and then I'll present to the two main ideas, I'd say, that we have for the nickel formation on, on this deposit. Okay, so here's a map of the geological, here's a geological map of the Karajas province. I don't expect everyone to be familiar with it, so basically, in a nutshell, the Karajas is a Mesoarchean basement that has been reworked at 2.8, and then intruded uh, by felsic and mayfield mafic magmas at 2.7. Now, this basement is overlain, but what sometimes is called the Karajas Basin, uh, which is basically a series of new Archean, also 2.7 uh, greenstone belt sequences. And then later on, everything is cross cut by these 1.8 A type granites that are widespread throughout the, all, all the province. Um, it's for this talk, it's also important to mention the switch catete, the catete switch, sorry, uh, which are the mayfield to mayfield intrusions down in the south that may be mineralized in nickel, but uh, it's a lateritic nickel mineralization. And also the Serralest suite, which may contain PGE mineralization. And uh, also, it's worth mentioning the two important mines here that we have the Sosego Sequedinho mine and the Salobo mine, which are IOCG mines, uh, major plays in the copper gold production. And around the Sosego Sequedinho mine, we have several clusters of deposits, uh, such as the Castanha, Jatobá, and the GT34 deposit over here, which is the topic of this talk. Uh, so, just a brief overview of the exploration. Uh, the GT34 was first discovered in 1999 by Dossigel, now known as Bali. Uh, it was discovered during a regional geotem survey. Uh, it was a 34 anomaly, therefore the name GT34. And the target selection led to exploration deal cores with dozens of meters of semi-massive semi subbrachiated sulfide. Uh, those sulfides were not particularly interested for copper and gold, however, they were interested for nickel. And then the exploration resumed back in 2003 with just uh, geophysics, ground geophysics, and systematic drilling. Uh, tenors and gray are not available for publication, but I can say that it's a small deposit. And yes, it's not a major sulfide nickel deposit. Okay. Now, just zooming in into the GT34 region, uh, we can see over here the Sosego mine and 12 kilometers southwest of the mine, we found the GT34. It's pretty much aligned with the same northeastern north she zone. Uh, when you zoom into, into the deposit, we can see that it's basically a 1.5 kilometer long up to 500 meters depth. Uh, it's a basically a metasomatic halo uh, of a series of alteration sequences. And when you look at a cross section, we can see that pretty much the metasomatic halo and the sulfides are subvertical and more or less but super parallel to the shoes one. And zooming in into the lithologies, we can we'll start talking about the host rock. Uh, they are mostly felsic, felsic gneisses. Uh, here we have a tonalitic, tonalitic gneiss. Uh, you can see the low angle foliation that is marked by hornblende and biotite, mostly hornblende. And we can see over here that this host rocket has start develop some alteration pods that as you get closer to, to the deformation zone, this foliation that is low angle start to become high angle. Here we can see the subvertical, sort of see the subvertical alignments. And we start to recognize the first alteration zone that we call scopolite or the peroxine alteration. Uh, so this dark layers that we see is basically all orthoperoxine and this lighter zone is scopolite. Uh, until, we get to the, until we get to the center of the, the alteration or the shear zone where we, we don't see any foliation anymore is basically a massive 
scopolite over here, this light greenish, and orthopyroxene over here. Uh, now, when you look at the fin section, we can see the splunar contacts between the scopolite and orthopyroxene. Orthopyroxene may have this granular fashion, may sometimes form larger crystals. Um, we also have some relic texture so of scopolite. So scopolite overprinting the, the igneous or the previous uh, plagioclase. And as a deformation, we can see that over here and over here on the shadows, they start to develop the granular, orthopyroxene start to form as a granular fashion. So highlighting this deformation and metasomatic characteristic. Uh, when you look at the mineral chemistry, you can see the scopolite is mostly marialite, so the sodic and amber. And when you look at the orthopyroxene mineral chemistry, you can see there, are, there is some difference between the GT34 orthopyroxene and typical magmatic orthopyroxene. So GT34 here is in red, and the others are magmatic orthopyroxene. And it's common to see a variation between as uh, aluminum and chromium, titanium and chromium, even calcium. Uh, you can sort of see a trend and a variation in the orthopyroxene mineral chemistry. However, when you look at the GT34, you can see that the values are always low. Uh, there's based, most of the values are actually in fact zero, so they are not plotting here. But we don't see this variation, so it doesn't really match with a typical magmatic evolution, supporting an, uh, uh, a metasomatic or maybe a different origin formation. Uh, progressing through the alterations, we have the development of the main alteration stage, which is the hornblende coropatite plagioclase alteration. Uh, this alteration forms a uh, replacement zone, so we can see it's starting to develop over here and over here. And this will envelop all the other alterations and is mostly represented by hornblende and chloropatite. Um, we, as you can see here, this basically in hornblendite. It can have a uh, fine grain texture. Sometimes it's aligned, the minerals are aligned. When the mineralization is in touch with the horn blend, horn blend can get coarse grain. So you can see this coarse large prisms. Uh, when you look at the thin sections, the relation is also there. So here you can see the more aligned horn blend crystals. And here on the bottom right, you can see the, the coarse grains in touch with the mineralization. This white, part here is a raw chloroapatite. Uh, it's very common when you're close to the mineralization. And the other thing that we see, it's not so common, but you can see here an ICM image. You can see that plagioclase associated with corn blend is forming after the scopolite. So here is marialite. And here we have the formation of a little bit of plagioclase associated. Following up, we have the nickel mineralization, which is the main mineralization stage. So here's how the, the ore looks like. Here's a, a sulfide breccia, uh, typical with these round fragments and large coarse apatite grains. Can also be a neck texture. Uh, when they have this texture here on the bottom, it's rich, typically rich, a little bit richer in copper, not significant, but it's, there's more calcopyrite. Uh, this mineralization cross cut both, both the scapolite rich alteration and horn blend rich alteration, forming those sort of pipes or vertical branches concentration. Uh, when you look at the fin section, we can see that it's, it is mostly pentlandite rich. So here we have this pentlandite. A little bit of pyrotite. Pyrotite is also common, uh, normally loaded with uh, inclusions. Calcopyrite will be most common on the borders. And then the tiny bit of magnetite, and there might also be some pyrite over here, as you see in the top right corner. Uh, again, over here, we see another picture of the, the ore. So, apatites over here, pentandite. Uh, pentandite typical ha has typically the octahedral partition. And when we look at the SCM picture, we can see that pyrite, pentandite may also be present at exolution flames, and when in contact with the mineralization, the, if, when in contact with apatite, there might be a deformation of monocyte. Uh, when you look at the whole rock, this data is from Tepiski, 2008. Uh, we can see that the sulfide mineralization or the ore is fairly enriched in, in phosphorum, so up to 22, 21% phosphorum and 0.3% light hair earth elements. 
So therefore, highlighting this unconventional nickel mineralization, like we wouldn't expect this to a normal sulfide nickel. And following up the nickel mineralization, we still have two minor alteration stages, which are the phlogopite dull actinolite. Uh, so this base, uh, these are mostly phlogopite rich veins forming irre irregular boundaries. Uh, this will cross cut uh, the previous alteration and cross cut the mineralization as well. Uh, when cutting orthoperoxane rich zones, talc tends to develop more. Uh, when cutting the horn blend rich alteration, there's development of actinolite. Uh, when you look again at fin section, you can see this phlogopite rich zone with fragments of orthoperoxine and horn blend as well. And over here in the right, we see a more narrow vein, more sharp boundary vein of talc, actinolite, a little bit of phlogopite. And there's also a case bar veinlet, which marks our next alteration or late stage, which are the late stage veinlets. So these are very complex mineral mineralogy, so parse, plagioclase, case bar, epidote. The case bar is typically red. You can have calcite, titanite, a lot of, a lot of minerals in there. Uh, and these will basically cross cut, they are very narrow. And the interesting thing is when they cross cut the mineralization, so here the, the sample is broken along the vein, but all the sulfides that we are looking at here, that's mostly mirror, miller, millerite. So these veins, they may locally remobilize the initially pentonite rich ore. Uh, again, uh, we did a little bit of geochronology on, the sam on those samples. So from two samples, uh, we, from two distinct samples, we recovered zircons. The first one was a uh, scapolite orthoperoxane alteration. We were able to, re to recover some igneous zircons associated with the host rocks. We can clearly see the zoning over here, giving this 2.8 to 3.0, sometimes 3.0 cores. Uh, however, when you when we look at the sum of the other populations, we can see highly metasomatized zircons that we don't see the clear correlation that we see over here. And those zircons, they yield around 2.7 age, highlighting the, the presence of this temp these fluids that has metasomatized pretty much all the rocks. Now, the two main ideas that we have of, of how the nickel came to be uh, uh, the first one that I would like to address is the superimposed magmatic nickel sulfide. Uh, in order for this to be true, the sulfide liquid must have segregated and accumulated away from the silicate reservoir. Uh, now this can happen. Uh, it's known to happen in dynamic environments such as conduits. Uh, then the sulfide accumulation would have been metasomatized and superimposed. Uh, another option that we can sort of guess would be a, co a origin related to comadiite. Recently on the Karajas, Karajas region, the selva comadiite has been identified. Maybe the comadiite has segregated the sulfide and then with the deformation and metasoma metasomatism, it has been detached from the comadiites. Uh, it's a little bit of arm waving, I know, but it could be. Uh, the biggest problematic is that we, on the, for this type of origin for magmatic, is that we can't see uh, an intrusion directly correlated with GT34 mineralization. So we don't know if there's intrusion down, that, down deep, uh, if the intrusion has been overprinted, or if it's somewhere else, if everything has been moved. And also, sulfide saturation is not significant around the, the surrounding cutted test suite, which is the, the MAFI magmatism on the south. So it's hard to, to, to picture a magma or an unknown magma that would generate the sulfides. The other option would be an IOCG related mineralization. Of course, saying it's an IOCG without iron oxide, copper, and gold. It's very tricky. However, all the other characteristics are present. It's a structurally controlled metasomatic alteration. The ores are present in brecha types. And we have it associated light earth and polymetallic enrichment. 
on a side note, Nico is very common on IOCGs, um, in Castanha, Jatobá, and throughout other deposits in the Carajás province and throughout the world. And also, the other question is how nickel would be transported, transported in the system. So with high temperature, highly saline fluids have been described, reaching HCL. So some experiments that have shown that maybe nickel can be, can be moved on, this, on these conditions. So maybe an IOCG origin could also be the case. Now, I'm not saying neither of the options are correct. Uh, there, there may also be a third option, of which I, in fact, I think it's the correct. And I believe we were sort of looking uh, at a, an interface between magmatic and hydrothermal. Neither IOCG or magmatic are the perfect fit, but who knows, we need more study and in order to solve this. And that's it. Thank you.